Oh my goodness. It says on my end that it's streaming live on Facebook now. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're I think we're it. I think we got it. Yes. All right. I see it on this side too. All right, so let's give them a few minutes to jump on here. And we can go ahead and get started. I'm, ex I'm pretty excited about having this conversation with you. I am as well. It's so good to uh, I know we talked for almost an hour the other day, if not longer. <laughs> But it's good to see some some movement with the voice too. I know we're not in person, but this is as close as we could get. Yeah, but you know that's what happens when you don't talk and then you try to tell it all at one time. And right. I was like, oh Lord, I got to do better. But I always enjoy having conversation with you. Thank so I'm you. Looking forward to tonight. Okay. Oh, okay. They said they hear us both loud and clear. Awesome. So my team, we got the thumbs up. Okay. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, Natalie, for joining me today. Uh, my team is very excited about this topic. As I talked to you the other day, I said I wanted to have this conversation mm -hmm. uh, about what's going on today. So I want to uh, greet a couple of our people that are on here. So I see you guys. Greetings, greetings, greetings. I want you to take a moment to share uh, this live before we get started. Good. Let's get our numbers up a little bit because I think this is the subject that really is a conversation that needs to be had in probably almost every household. That's so right. we just wanna encourage people to jump on, just say, we're gonna have a good dialogue today. Uh, we have this wonderful professional woman. I cannot wait for you guys to just hear from her. I absolutely love just her poise and her grace and um, just her tenacity for helping people. So I think she's going to help us out today. Those numbers are looking better already. So uh, <laughs> grateful to God for that. So let's keep sharing. You guys put those names in there, tag people, say jump on here. We're talking about uh, a little bit of COVID-19 and the pandemic. But we're going to talk about just the position that we are in right now. We're going to focus on families tonight. And as if you've been following us on Facebook, then you know that we're going to be dealing with individuals and children a little bit later on. But Miss Dyer is going to deal with family violence and things that occur uh, in families during this difficult time. If you're like me, you're probably tired of being in the house right now. And so um, just like uh, probably all of you that are listening right now, you're trying to figure out other things to do and then we get tired. So I wanted to talk to a professional because we, we deal with mental anguish and sometimes we're stressed and we're frustrated and we don't quite know how to deal with it. So that's some of the stuff we wanna talk about today. So just share, so greetings to everybody. Hello, I see you guys. So glad you have joined me today. So I am with Natalie Dyer and she's a license, y'all. She got real license. So <laughs> she's not one of those makeshift um, counselors. I did look, look up a little bit about you. So I'll give you an opportunity, I don't know if this is updated but you've been doing this for 16 years is that uh, right a little over 20. So, yeah see I've, I said this might be old a little over 20 years you've been doing this mm -hmm. wow okay so well y'all she got 20 years experience so you know <laughs> she knows what she's talking about so listen I just want to talk tonight I want to talk about how uh, we deal with some of the things that we have to deal with in an effective manner because we don't always deal with things the right way and sometimes things are going on in our households or other households and you don't know how to help and so this came out of people asking me how to deal with specific things at this juncture and so this is where we're going to start so i did some research i was ministering and i was doing this series and i did some research and i found out that uh, domestic violence rates had gone up tremendously since COVID-19. And it blew me away because I didn't even consider it. I, I, I didn't. I thought about all the other things, you know, no food and, you know, people losing their jobs and so forth. But I didn't think about what would happen for people who are stuck in the house with 
someone who may be an abuser or they themselves might be an abuser. But it didn't, it didn't cross my mind until I started looking at some of the numbers and I decided I wanted to talk about this family violence. One of the other things I shared with her was I read about the young man that lost his life in Atlanta and it really touched my heart. I was really heavy because he went outside without his parents' permission and tried to come back in. And they were so terrified of getting COVID-19 that his father, uh, stepfather shot him and killed him. And so where somebody might think that is really extreme, but when people are afraid, you really don't know what what will happen and how they will react. So I wanna talk about that tonight while we have you uh, on the line. So that's what I lay out is going to be, y'all. We're going to have some conversations. If you have questions, please put your questions in the queue in your comment section. My team are going to get those questions to me so that I can get them to the professional. She's going to answer. Um, uh, we can't answer everybody. So we're going to vet them and try to get the ones that are most, you know, uh, that will relate to most of us. Sure. So uh, just keep that in mind and anything else, we'll probably t try to type it up and see if we can get it, get it to her. So mm -hmm. let's start here. I read this comment, intimate terrorism. Mm -hmm. And when I first mm -hmm. read it, I was like, what? <laughs> intimate terrorism or what? What is that? And so the more I studied, I realized it is just um, an attack from those who you've been intimate with, those who you love. And when we talk about family violence, we're not just talking about a man and a woman. For we're sure. talking about any type of violence in the home. Mm -hmm. And so with that, we'll start there. So I wanna first ask you, do you agree that there's an increase in family violence due to COVID-19 or the pandemic? Most definitely. Um... And the increase is because people are forced to be at home, if you will, not by choice. Um, a lot of times when people are in domestic violence situations, they can almost calculate when the violence will happen. Um, they get used to the pattern of things, but their pattern was completely thrown off when mom or dad couldn't go to work. They shut down the business or they got laid off or they, um, they, they just lost their job. So everybody is at home at one time. And that may not typically happen until the weekends uh, on a usual basis, but now everybody is at home seven days a week because the, um, is that, got the feedback. They get used to the pattern of things, but their pattern was completely thrown off when mom or dad couldn't go to work. They shut down the business if they had to get off. And that may not typically happen until the weekends on, on a usual basis, but now everybody is at home. Seven. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll pick up where I was. Everybody is at home. No. Um, now everybody is at home seven days a week. And so um, the violence then increases because mom or dad may come home on Friday after work. They may have stopped by the liquor store. They may have stopped at the club. They may have done all of those things. And then they come home and the dishes may not be washed or um, the wife may not, the kids may be up and the, and the husband is expecting for the kids to have been asleep or whatnot. But that is happening more regularly now because they can't go out now. They don't have that outlet. So right. they, don't, they don't have the outlet. They don't necessarily have the paycheck that they may have had, um, or just the fact that they have to put up with their family on a more consistent basis than what they're used to. So then the fam the violence definitely increases. Parents have become teachers. They've become the cafeteria lady. They've become the janitor. They've become the babysitter. They've become all of these things. They're playing all these roles that they're not used to being in on a regular basis, they're being forced to do it. And most people don't like to be forced to do anything anyway, uh -huh. but now they have to do it and it pertains to their significant other or their child or, um, or they themselves. Let's even talk about single people. The suicide rate is increasing some as well because yeah. people are now being, are at home alone. They can't necessarily go out. It's not wise to do it or whatnot. People may not allow them in their home like they typically might or whatnot. So the 
the mind is being traumatized, if you will, by COVID. And then you have somebody that you might live with that violates you on a regular basis. So we then have the compounded traumas that we're dealing with. And then I'm sure at some point we'll get into talking about the massacres of the African-American people. You know, So we have lots of things that are being um, uh, weighed, uh, laid on the shoulders of people. Yeah, and then it, it seems like it's not an end. It's, it, you know, I think if it was a natural disaster, mm-hmm. you're stressed for a little while, but you know that there's an end. Mm-hmm. But with this, it's like, you don't know. So every day it just seems to get more and more stressful because you don't see your way out. Yeah. And there's never a reason for anybody to abuse anybody, but you certainly understand how these environments or these situations do create a perfect recipe for that to happen. So uh, when I began to um, just read some of the stories, uh, for example, one of, one of the stories I read, this young lady said her husband uh, was so angry, I guess about being in the house and being, he lost his job, that he beat her while she was holding her 11 month old daughter with mm-hmm. the high chair, with the baby's high chair. Mm-hmm. And want giving her hematoma in her leg and so forth. And, and, and what she just was saying that it, it's no escape. Mm-hmm. She said, I, I, I usually have a way that I can get out to kind of deescalate, but there's no escape. And because of that, this is what's happening. Mm-hmm. And it's all over the world. It's not just the U.S. It's okay. everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I know families don't talk about it. They just kind of internalize it. You know, most people, they don't talk about it. If you're anything like me, I grew up. You don't tell what's going on in your house. Um, right. We didn't have the abuse thing, thank God. But there was some other stuff that we did have and you just, you don't talk about mm-hmm. what's going on inside. So I just started thinking about how many people might actually be dealing with, with this. And it just, it bothered me, you know, it really did. And so the more stories I read, I think the more it gripped me. In the UK, it said that the abuse hotline went up 65%. I thought it was crazy. Mm-hmm. Sick death. I was like, wait, what? Yeah, that, that is absolutely crazy. And so, then shelters aren't able to take people in. Yeah. So yeah. people aren't able to escape from it without then being put into trauma and put into a, a crisis within something else. You know, going out into the environment where there's COVID, you know, people with the COVID virus. It's, um, it's very sad. Um, you know, one of the things I read that I just had to mention to you that some of the abusers decided to even use the COVID as a way of com- controlling. Mm-hmm. So they they would threaten them mm-hmm. that if you go out and this happens, you mm-hmm. won't have anywhere to go because you can't come back mm-hmm. or that they wouldn't allow them to get medical attention. I mean, mm-hmm. so they actually use that mm-hmm. to manipulate and to control. Mm-hmm. So as we get further into this, there are five areas that I want to talk about today that I saw. It might be some extra stuff um, mm-hmm. that I'm sure you want to add, but I want to talk about people who are at, at risk, at mm-hmm. risk of, of um, experiencing family violence, whether it is siblings, uh, moms, children, mm-hmm. significant others. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it can be anybody, anybody that lives in your house. And what you consider as abuse, because sometimes you can be so accustomed <laughs> to things you don't really see it as abuse. You know, you're just like, well, that- it. yeah, yeah. You- thank you. You mm-hmm. just accept it. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to know if this was right, since you're the professional, one of the things they said, people with pre-existing mental health conditions are greater, I guess, the greater ones at risk of domestic violence during covid or pandemics, what do you think about that? I would agree with that. I would say that those with pre-existing mental health conditions are um, more susceptible to being in the um, in a domestic violence situation that could be on either side of the situation. So not necessarily just the victim, but the perpetrator could be um, and likely does have some mental health issue. Clearly there's some anger issue that has to be addressed. Um, but yeah, that, that's definitely true. Um, I think what may spring to mind for most people might be if you are a, a weaker person, meaning like a child or whatnot, but it really is the one that has a weakened mental health state that um, it's not able to 
talk their way out of, not able to reason their way out of, not able to figure out how to get away from um, an abuser in a particular situation or uh, talk themselves down from, uh, from the cliff, if you will, if they are the abuser. So yeah, right. I would definitely agree with that. You mentioned anger. When, we all get angry. For sure. When should it be concerning that, because like we said, sometimes people are so accustomed until they don't recognize that that line has been crossed. Mm -hmm. So when should somebody be concerned, even, even with themselves, mm -hmm. that my anger is not normal? Right. Well, self-control is uh, a fruit of the spirit and <laughs> not a lot of people have self-control. Self-control speaks of our discipline. It speaks of our, um, of our, our ability to kind of uh, dictate what it is that we will and will not do. Um, we give ourselves permission to be angry but a lot of times we don't give ourselves permission to actually feel the emotion that we are probably feeling more than we are the anger. By that, I mean, um, anger is what's called a secondary emotion. It's easy to become angry. You know, I tell clients this often, we kind of come out the womb angry because now we're in this cold environment, it's bright, there's talking going on and I can hear the voice of that person that I heard for nine months while I was inside her belly, you know, what is going on? So we come out screaming and hollering because things are just not what we're used to. Um, then we grow up, we're hungry, we scream and holler. We're wet, we scream and holler. Uh, we wanna be held, we scream and holler. Well, after a while, as we grow up and as parents teach us in a healthy environment, we then learn to communicate in a better way that mom or dad, I'm hungry, mom or dad, I'm thirsty, mom or dad, I need to use the bathroom. And we just, and we grow from there. We learn those different lessons. Well, at some point, if we are given everything that we ask for, or we're not, or things are withheld from us, then those are the things that can easily set up um, other emotions within us that we're not really able to identify or label. So then we revert back to the anger because that gets people's attention, you know? So then um, when people become angry as adults or even um, older children, the identification of whether it's too much or not is, is lacking in a lot of people. But those that are able to see, okay, my husband or my wife has made me, have made me upset or made me sad. I've said that to them. They don't get it. So I get angry. Now they pay attention to me. If you're able to identify the difference between the two and to manipulate, because that's what that boils down to, you're able to manipulate, then you know that your anger is being used as a tool rather than a genuine expression of what it is that you're actually wow. feeling, you know? And so it becomes too much when you are using it as a tool and you know it, or it becomes too much when you are at a point where the thoughts become um, harm harmful to someone else, harmful to yourself, um, damaging of property, um, doing, um, doing, uh, uh, um, acts that are that are detrimental not necessarily to yourself or anybody else but destroying someone's property um we can i can even speak to the rioting even though the it's a, a righteous anger but that act is still a wrong thing because then it's still the crime so sure. you know it, it it there has to be there's that identification that is either being missed or being ignored when it comes to you know whether it's too far or not i like that that's good. That's good. So since anger is probably the foundation with most of this, when it comes to the domestic piece, mm -hmm. whether we are talking about the race, the racial component, or we're talking about, I don't have a job. I don't know how we're going to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And so people act out in whatever uh, capacity. Mm -hmm. I know that there are some people that are dealing with it. Um, one of the second things they talked about that I think hit home because I know somebody who's caring for one is caring for family members, or loved ones. Mm -hmm. And when you feel like you're the only one who's doing whatever, especially if you have siblings. I have a family member that has uh, quite a bit of siblings. Mm -hmm. She's the youngest and it just seems like she does the majority. 
-hmm. And I can imagine like in a situation like this, Mm -hmm. the anger or the stress of, I can't get any help and people react in that way. Mm -hmm. She's not the kind of person that would abuse. Well, you know what? I don't think that she is. Mm -hmm. But when people are pressed and stressed and Mm -hmm. they have their own issues and then you have to care for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you to speak to that because that's a lot of responsibility. For certain. certain. You said said that you, um, we feel like anger is the, baseline is the word that I'm going to use. I don't know. That's the term that you use. Yeah. I don't necessarily agree with that. I believe fear is the baseline. Okay. Okay. I believe that anger is the emotion that's being expressed though, because fear is typically looked at as a weak emotion. Yes. And anger typically is seen as something that is strong and big. Yeah. You you know, whereas fear really is a lot larger than anger is because fear will make you do things that you never thought that you would do. True. You know? Um, so when it comes to being one that care that's caring for a family member or whatnot, um, boundaries are necessary in, in any situation, boundaries are necessary. But when it comes to um, being you being the only one that's doing it, and it kind of sounds in this situation like they may be caring for a parent. Right. Uh, so if they're caring for a parent, but then their siblings aren't doing anything, excuse me, then um, I would I would advise them if their family members are not going to step in, if there are friends that might be willing to assist, and of course, as um, safely as possible, everybody wear a mask, everybody wear gloves, those are then some steps that they may have to take in order to be able to give themselves a break. Um, even though it may not necessarily, again, be the safest thing, but there's sometimes that we have to make sacrifices in order for us not to lose it. You know, Um, if she is being, or if I say she, I'm making an assumption here, if they are being pushed and pushed and pushed, but the siblings aren't doing anything and she's wearing the weight of maybe their own family or uh, work and then caring for the loved one, then they have to, involve somebody else in that situation and if there are other people that are willing and able to come and assist I would suggest that they allow them you know um, go through all the possible steps maybe try to have them tested early before they come Um, but incorporate somebody else in that if you possibly can because they have to have a break because what will happen is that their bodies will break down they may be able to continue to do the tasks but their bodies are going to stop them at some point and say, you can't do this alone anymore. Um, And those siblings, if they are a person that um, won't necessarily make a phone call for themselves and um, guard themselves or whatnot, have somebody else make the phone call for them and make the siblings aware, um, okay, this is what's going on with your mother. This is what's going on with your sibling. Um, can you take this day to come and do X, Y, and Z? Can you take this day and maybe set up a schedule just to administrate the entire thing for them if that one person is not able to do it on their own? Yeah, um, it, 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 I wish it could happen like that. Yeah. I just, when we look at people, especially if you're caring for a parent, because I have several friends and I'm at that age now, my parents are older, And so we all chip in and we help our parents out. My mom is still very active, Mm -hmm. but I was thinking when you're dealing with something like we're dealing with today and you're already stressed because this is what you deal with all the time. And now you have COVID on top of it. Mm -hmm. So if you're locked in the house with this person and nobody comes to relieve you Mm -hmm. or, or they have excuses or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. just the way you're internalizing it if you're not careful it could put you in a position to become abusive and 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 that's the part I wanted to deal with because people it it's easy to judge somebody else's situation Mm -hmm. but when you're in it and you're dealing with it and I like that you said fear fear will make you do things that you didn't think that you would do which is true Mm -hmm. and so I was just thinking how people wind up in these situations and the more I thought about it I'm like you know if you're it 
and you don't have a release and the parents might not necessarily know all that you are doing if they are if they have dementia or anything like that mm -hmm. or alzheimer's or something they don't even know all of that you're doing all the sacrifices and it may seem like it's not appreciated mm -hmm. and if you feel like that sometimes people react mm -hmm. in a you know in a mm -hmm. negative way mm -hmm. so i just wanted to say to the listeners that are on here uh, if you know anybody in that situation, I like the suggestion that she made that you can be willing to, if you can help, if you're, you know, if you're clear and you've been tested and you can help re relieve that person, then let's do that. Because okay. I think we spend so much time focused on all the other stuff, giving people food and, you know, all of that, even though we need food, but we also need our sanity. Yeah, and if definitely. people don't get a break, you know, I, I can, easily, I can see how they can lose it you know, and have a breakdown. Yeah. So um, let me say this to them as well. Um, even, even simpler things give small breaks, just going outside, you know, when, when the parent or whomever might be um, taking a nap or whatnot, they take a nap, you go outside and that be your break. You know, if that's, if that's what it all boils down to, but taking those moments, it's like a, that's like a, um, a mother with a newborn, you know, at home with that baby all of the time, you know, that's where we get a lot of the shaken baby syndrome because it gets overwhelming because yeah. there's not time for you just to be you. Um, but if you can just go outside and take a break, um, if somebody else can just come for 30 minutes even, you know, just the simplest things can uh, rest your mind, making sure that you're eating properly, drinking your water, taking your vitamins and supplements and things of that nature and making sure that your body is healthy. That helps your mind as well. Yes, yeah. And it helps you not to become resentful because when you talked about the, the ba shaking baby syndrome or newborn, uh, I, I remember having my first mm -hmm. and I, actually did experience postpartum. I didn't know that's what I was dealing with. My mom happened to be there helping me and my husband. And I just got so emotional out of nowhere. I'm not an emotional person like that, but it just, it came on me and I just started crying. I was like, you guys are talking about me. And they just kind of looked at me like, okay. But <laughs> I mean, I was like, wild it out. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't even know why I feel like this. And my mom just kind of, you know, walked me through it. But I felt like I should have been able to calm my own baby down. And, mm -hmm. and I guess I was overwhelmed and just not feeling the best. And so I think people in that same boat, you might start to be resentful. If you're home with the kids all day and your husband's at work and those mm -hmm. kids are driving you crazy and he comes in and he's sleepy or whatever, you're like, I've been with these darn kids all day. I need a break. Yes. And so I don't think people think about that. And, you know, the man might think or if the husband is working, he'll think, well, I've been working all day. You're like, well, I've been working all day, too. Mm -hmm. and, and I can see how those situations can easily turn toxic. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everybody needs a break and you have to value what everybody does and what they bring to the table. Because if you don't, then we find we find ourselves in these situations. Most so. Definitely. So um, let's go a little bit further. Oh, this is good. They're, they're giving feedback on here. I love it. So number three says people who use substances mm -hmm. or alcohol are at greater risk for domestic violence. Talk to us. Most definitely. Because your mind is in an altered state. You know, um, you don't have any control over your mind when you are um, high on uh, marijuana or heroin or methamphetamine or uh, wet or all of those different whack or all of those other things that are um, out there in the street drugs now. You don't have any control over yourself. Yeah. Um, if you are drinking uh, excessively and then become inebriated, you don't have any control over yourself. And it does alter the state of your mind because it alters the chemicals in your mind. All of those substances do. They alter the chemicals in your mind and um, you are not functioning in a balanced state, uh, which might be typical for you. Um, and so then you act out based on um, where it is that your mind is in that moment. So if there is something that triggers you and uh, it makes you angry or it makes you sad or whatnot, then you respond out of that, not how you might have responded before, because you very well could have been a person that might have a conversation. But if you're high on some drug, 
then that drug is the thing that is controlling you. So you respond like the drug would have for you to con- have you to respond. And then that's a whole spiritual thing there too, but we don't really like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you know what? It makes so much sense. One of the things I didn't understand, and, and I have to say this into the listeners, I, I know that people, some people drink because they can't cope right. or they drink because they're sad, but then the alcohol makes you sadder, but, but they don't think that. And so they don't want to feel anything. So drink or smoke or whatever it is you do. You say, I don't want to feel the pain and it helps me not to deal with the pain of it. But then when you're not yourself, you wind up doing stuff that you don't want to do. And then you're sorry after you come off your high, you realize that you showed your behind and this is what you've done. <laughs> and, and then what do you do? You feel bad and you do go back and do what? <laughs> go back and get your drink <laughs> on, <laughs> high on again. Right. Now you can't, yeah, you can't, you can't, call, you're like, I just can't deal with this foolishness mm-hmm. it's just, it's too much. <laughs> so one of the numbers I, I, that I read today that scared me, cause I was like, this can't be real. It says, as the nation has sheltered at home sales of alcohol have skyrocketed Mm -hmm. with some sales rising as much as 243 percent yeah that is somebody's getting a drink on (laughs) they lit they like all they don't know what day it is they don't know what month they lit lit all day and all night they all day and all night they (laughs) tow up i was like oh my god but but it does talk about the frame of mind that people are in. Mm-hmm. It's just like, you know what? I just, I don't want to deal with it. And so I definitely can see how that can lead to domestic issues. And whether you, you get your gun or you shoot somebody because you're hallucinating or you're angry to that degree. I, we've had people to do stuff when they're angry. Um, I remember we said before, never make a permanent decision over a temporary situation. Yeah. But when you when you lit, you just it it all together. It's just one big right. ball. Right. Yes. Wow. Mm-hmm. So okay. So let's go a little bit further. Yeah. Number four will probably hit most people that are on here because they say, I ain't doing all that. But people that have lost their jobs, uh, their hours have been reduced, mm-hmm. or they had some major change in their employment uh, that they are at risk. Mm-hmm for some type of violence. So let's talk a little bit about people with that major change because you ain't got no money. But right. Yeah. And that that outside of pandemic, not having a money is a is a, uh, uh, a life changer, if you will. I do want to say this in regards to domestic violence. We typically uh, immediately think of physical violence when we talk about domestic violence. But there is a uh, emotional and a psychological violence that happens as well, or abuse that happens as well. Um, and that happens a lot more frequently than physical violence does. Um, so if you have someone that has lost their job and they are now, um, they may now be working a part time job or no job at all. And so then that for them, and I, I can say, especially a man, that for them is minimizing of who they are as a whole, not just in the, the, the realm of providing, but just their manhood, period, because they are not, they're no longer able to provide for their family to ensure that their family has shelter and food and, you know, just their well being is just not being taken care of as best as maybe he used to. So now, because he is now down on himself because of um, a lost job, he may talk to his wife a certain way now that maybe before he didn't. He may call her names now. He may never ever put his hands on her because that's not always the case, but he, um, he may talk to her, demean her. He may yell at the kids a lot more. He may sit outside on the uh, back porch and smoke his cigars and not come in the house all day long. That's emotionally abusive to a family when you are there and they want to be with you, but you won't allow them to be with you. That can be damaging. Um, if there is a uh, if there's a mom that maybe she worked in the school system of some in some capacity and now she's no longer uh, able to do that uh, because of the pandemic. So now again, she's home and she's doing all of these things. And now she sees that um, when the teacher called home and said that your kid did X, Y, and Z, <laughs> You saw your kid do X, Y, and Z because you tried to teach your own kid 
you right. know, those things. And so you've experienced that. So now you're yelling at your kid, whereas you may have yelled at the teacher. Now you're yelling at the kid. So all of those things happen. And then there may be a slap on the face or a smack across the head that may not be typical um, because we're frustrated. We're annoyed. You are, you're in my space, you know? And I really think that that's where our, um, where our country has a huge downfall, one of them, a uh, huge downfall because there's so many other countries that school is not eight hours a day and work is not eight hours a day. Those things are cut up into, um, into uh, uh, um, palatable sizes, if you will, or time frames where you're able to spend time with your family so that being at home with your family for 10 or 12 hours is not this uh, um, new thing. You know, it's the norm, whereas here, we're used to coming home at six and seven o'clock at night, running and cooking dinner real fast, everybody in the shower, everybody in the bed, and then we get up and we do it all over again, right. but we're only home for a couple of hours uh, with one another, and most of those were sleep, you know? That's true. So when the people have lost their uh, lost their jobs, yes, that is a very higher, uh, a, a much higher um, risk of domestic violence in every way. Yeah. The violence. I, 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 I definitely um, see that. If you don't have any money, I mean, let's just be real. You don't have any money and you don't know how you're going to pay your, pay your bills, especially if you have children who yes. are depending on you. Mm -hmm. And so those kids have to be fed. You have to pay your rent or your mortgage or whatever. Mm -hmm. Even with the, I think they, they put, um, I can't think of the word so that they don't evict them, but the thought that you owe these people this money Yes. And as soon as the government lifts whatever the sanction that says that you can't evict them, then mm -hmm. they're going to start evicting these people left and right yeah. if they don't come up with that money. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things my husband and I said, because some of them said, well, you can pay it at the end. Well, how can I pay it at the end? If I can't pay it right now, right. I can't pay it all in one lump sum. That's, that's right. crazy. Yeah, and that was $1,200. I was like, I don't know what they're going to pay that $1,200. But it, it just... I, it's very stressful. And yeah. I love that you brought up uh, about the men because men, the majority, you know, or some, let me say some, yeah. they feel that they should be the breadwinners. They feel mm -hmm. that they should be the lead. Mm -hmm. And if they can't take care of their families, I'm sure they do feel some kind of way, mm -hmm. you know, that, sure. that it, it's stressful and men deal with things differently than we do. Sure. Most of them uh -huh. deal with things differently. And so, yeah, sitting on that back porch and not communicating and, you know, she may be saying, why can't you just talk to me and tell me how you feel, you know, talk to me. And he's mm -hmm. like, I don't feel like talking, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. And, mm -hmm. and that can become really, uh, a really difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And it's not that he's wrong for the way he feels or she's wrong for the way they feel. It's just, I think it goes back to that communication piece you said in the beginning, mm -hmm. knowing how to communicate effectively mm -hmm. so that everybody can be heard. Mm -hmm. because when you don't do that you feel like what's the use right like, why, why am I here mm -hmm. and so um additionally you talked about that mom who's now I have to teach these kids and some of the people at our church is it's funny uh one of the moms she she uh said that she was retired <laughs> from teaching <laughs> she said she's retired you know she had to teach it she had, she had a high schooler and um an elementary mm -hmm. schooler and one of the things people don't think about is if you have three kids at every grade level and they all have work to do and, and you have your work to do and don't have a baby too. Right. It's like, oh my God. Yeah, it can be really stressful. And I see how people can really just lose their self-control. Things that don't normally upset them mm -hmm. can really set them off. And you know that concern about how we're going to make it so um, I got a couple of questions that came in from the audience. Let me read that before we get any further into this. This is good stuff. All right. So let's go back to, I guess, number, this question came in kind of late. We talked about the caregivers at number two. They want to know, being a former caregiver, what suggestions, what suggestions do you have for a person that wants and needs help but isn't trusting of anyone that offers the help? Ooh, Ooh that's a good question. So, <laughs> something that my dad says often um, to people, my dad's a country boy, um, 80 years old and, you know, 
definitely stuck in his ways. But he says this, he says, I'm not going to fight you to help you. And that may be hard to say to somebody that you care about, that you want to offer help to, but they won't accept it because they don't trust. That then says that they are going to have to suffer a little more because you can't make somebody accept your help. You can't. If it's being offered to them and they're saying no, because they might, and, and their, their concern might be legitimate. Maybe they will do X, Y, and Z. That may be legitimate, but everybody is not, um, uh, not at a place where you can't trust them. Everybody's not that. So everybody that offers their assistance is not, uh, is not going to steal from you, harm you, you know, do anything, tell anybody your business or whatever the thought might be. That's not always the case. And at some point, there's going to have to either be a, um, a trust, a step toward trust, or you continue to deal with it all on your own. Those are the only two options. All right. I love that answer. You think sometimes people are just dependent on you? You know, yeah. if, if you're doing it and they're just accustomed to you're doing it and they don't want anybody else. So they mm -hmm. find something wrong with everybody else because they just want you to they do it. Want, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. so, all right. I yeah. agree. So number two question from the audience, how do we deal more or better with emotional abuse? Mm. Okay. <laughs> um, that's a, that's an interesting um, perspective on things because emotional abuse a lot of times gets swept under the rug because there are no physical scars yeah um and it gets ignored a lot because there are no physical scars um but speaking personally and having been in an emotionally abusive uh relationship it's one of the most difficult things to get out of because you don't necessarily want to tell anybody what it is that you are enduring because people look at you a certain way. So they may assume, oh, well, you're stronger than that. Why would you let them say X, Y, and Z? Or why would you let them do X, Y, and Z? So the first step that I took was that I got into counseling, you know, and counseling is so easy to get into now because most of it is done virtually. Yeah. You know, so you don't necessarily have to go into an office. You can have your cell phone. You can walk outside for an hour and talk to somebody about what's going on with you. And they can help you with the different tools that you need. Um, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. So I prayed a lot um, because I, I started to understand that I didn't think like I used to think. So I wanted to try and get my mind back. And I didn't know why it had changed so much. Um, so I started to pray a lot. So I went to counseling. I prayed a lot. I started to journal, which is a tool that I give most of my clients. I started to journal. And so now I have a book coming out of my journals because all of my thoughts, I was able to get them out. If you're not able to afford counseling journal, because it's very therapeutic for you to write your thoughts out and go back and read them and see where your mindset was a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, it helps you to either decide, am I gonna stay here or am I gonna move forward? And I think the most important thing is to realize that you have control over you. Nobody else gets to control you unless you allow them to. Whoop, she preaching. Yeah. I'm like, amen. They, they don't get to control you unless you allow them to. So there has to be a decision made to choose you and once you choose yourself, then start doing the work on yourself to strengthen you, to strengthen you up here. What is it that you think about a thing opposed to accepting somebody else's thought or just settling or just giving in because if you feel a certain way that's opposing to somebody else and they might say, well, they get to say, but so do you. And you don't have to argue about things. You know, it just is what it is. I mean, it's not an argument if they're talking alone, just the last one. <laughs> very yeah. true very yeah. true I like I love everything you said but when you said I had to figure out why my mind had changed or how my mind had changed I, mm -hmm. I can relate to that and I think um some people focus so much on the other person until they don't think about what can I do or what have I done or what's different even with me how do I see myself mm -hmm. and uh, I definitely think counseling is something that everybody should consider. 
I remember when counseling was not popular with um, our kind of people. And I'll just say it like that because it's just like, you don't pay nobody to talk to, you know, you can talk to anybody, but we have professionals who help us know how to express ourselves, help us understand where we are, who we are and our expectations. And you do need people just like you have professionals for everything. And with our minds, we don't think we need a professional, but we do. And it's so easy to go off course. I've been off course before. I remember having to get back to myself too, Mm -hmm. trying to be everything to everybody and just like lost myself in, in the whole process and he was like okay I need to get this together and I was angry because of it nobody Mm -hmm. made me do it Mm -hmm. but I did it and then I felt like it didn't matter Mm -hmm. and so I think counselors do help you figure out what's going on with you and where you really want to be so Mm -hmm. I love that question uh emotional uh abuse even if it's not to the degree you call it abuse Anybody that makes you feel small, you know, that the things that they say to you make you second guess who you are and all of that is is emotional abuse. I mean, abuse might sound like a harsh word. Don't nobody want to use it. You know, they want to keep it pretty. Yeah, they want to keep it pretty, but it's not always pretty. And so you have to deal with the reality of what it really is. This is what it is. Especially not when you're the one that's going to bed at night crying or crying in the shower, crying on your way to work, crying to the grocery store, you know, feel like you're dying inside, stomach always upset, ulcers, heart problems, blood pressure, all of those things. Yeah, we have to get our minds right. And I truly, truly believe that a lot of the things that we deal with physically stem from how we deal psychologically. I believe if our minds are regulated, then we can easily change the way that our bodies um, function. Amen. Mm-hmm. And some of the illnesses we're dealing with <laughs> change our mind. Mm-hmm. I had someone and we're going to get to this last question so we can wrap up. Our time is going so fast. Okay. Um, I had someone who was in a, a relationship and it was a difficult. He, he was a emotionally abusive. I don't think he was physically abusive. You know, I don't know, but definitely emotional. And I remember talking to her just about different things, what she wanted to do. And I asked her, I said, what do you like to do? And she just looked at me. Oh my God. She had no clue. She burst into tears and she said, I don't even know what I like. Yeah. That thing broke my heart. Yeah. Because I was like, what? wait, what? What do you mean? She, she was so into trying to be yep. until she didn't even know what she liked. She didn't know what she wanted. And so definitely, I think counselors help us kind of decipher and uh, rediscover who we are. So um, I, I see on here, someone asked, where is, uh, they said, where's Dr. Natalie located? She's located in Texas, <laughs> but she does, um, you, you do uh, virtual counseling too, right? I do virtual counseling, but there, there are rules with that. So let me share that. The um, first thing, I'm not a doctor yet. Um, secondly, there are rules and parameters for um, for counselors within the United States. So uh, for me, I'm not able to counsel outside of Texas because I'm not licensed in other states. Okay. Uh, however, um, if there is coaching, I, I'm also a, a certified coach. Um, so I always think that my, my clients kind of get twofold. They get to have the wisdom of me as a counselor, but then, you know, the uh, kind of guidance of me as a, uh, as a coach. Coaching can be done worldwide. Counseling can only be done in the state. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's do the last question on here. And then the last question as far as the risk factors. And Mm -hmm. then we have two more points and we're going to get off because we have about eight minutes. Okay. Okay. So the last question, uh, the last risk, risk factor is people who are socially isolated from others, whether they're living away from family or friends, rural areas, but isolation. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? I I would agree with that as well, um, because when we are in an isolated state and we become lonely, then we will typically allow for things that we may not have allowed for before. Meaning um, if someone is single, or whatnot, um, say they date 
online. They may allow a person to come to their home that they would have, they would not have allowed before. They may have met them at the Starbucks or whatnot before, but with COVID, you can only drive through. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they may say, well, yeah, you can come over and we can just meet here. So now you've opened yourself up to a situation that you have no control over because you don't know who this is that you're allowing in your home first off. Uh, you don't know what they're capable of and things of that nature. Um, and then you are, you're also likely in a, um, in a uh, uh, lesser, your mindset might be lesser than what it used to be and not as uh, protective of yourself as you were before. Um, because you're uh, at home alone. You've been at home alone for three months now and this guy is showing you some interest. So yeah, come on over, why not? That's very dangerous. Um, others that um, might be working in a place, I found out today a really good girlfriend of mine, her husband's originally from um, Nigeria. He had gone home mm, maybe three weeks prior to the pandemic and everything being shut down. He had gone home and he was he was there um, caring for his family and doing business for five weeks. So he was there two weeks after the shutdown happened. He's right. still there today. Yeah, he so, can't get out. <laughs> right. So for her, um, it has put her in a position that uh, she calls me often and she's like, Matt, because they have three or four children. So she's caring for her children alone you know, over an extended period of time. So she calls me, she's like, I just need to talk a little bit, you know, or whatnot. Um, and then um, inviting maybe in-laws over, you know, I need some assistance because it becomes heavy, it becomes tiresome, it becomes worrisome. Mm -hmm. So that could easily trigger, you know, some um, some violence that wouldn't ordinarily be so um, in, in their situation. So yes, I definitely um, agree with that, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, the isolation um, component. I love that you brought in the component as far as the singles. I wasn't even thinking about that. But now that you say that, I realize a lot of the police departments are not even arresting people for certain things because they, they actually are releasing people right. from jails. Yeah. And, so yeah. if something were to happen, because during these times you do have sexual assaults mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. and, it might not be followed through the way it would be outside of COVID. So that is something to think about. And even in a relationship, if that happens, it might not be followed through. Right. You just don't know because the departments aren't responding the way they normally would. Crime certainly hasn't stopped. Right. You know, criminals yeah. are criminals, whether there's a pandemic or not. <laughs> you telling the truth. <laughs> so the other part of isolation is if you are in a relationship with somebody and mm -hmm. you're away from your family and they are abusive, mm -hmm. they, you know, could possibly, because you are separated from everybody, you feel like nobody loves you and you can feel like I'm just by myself. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. And it, they kind of get in your head and start mm -hmm. making you feel like you're devalued, you know, you don't have any value. So when you're isolated, they start playing with your mind. I think oh, the mothers used to say, um, what well, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. <laughs> they yeah, said, yeah. You know, said when, you, when you're like by yourself, and that's something that I've said, that when people are going through, even in their faith, and they start drifting, because you can see them drifting from church or drifting from people who would encourage them. And when they get away, their mind, like the enemy starts playing with their mind. So it is in relationships. When, when somebody is abusive or controlling or manipulative, if they have you, sep if, they have, if they manage to separate you from your family or your friends or just a, an ear, somebody who's going to tell you the truth, yeah. then it's easier to manipulate you. It's easier to control. And, and that's, in a sense, um, abuse as well. Most definitely. So, yeah. So I, I thought the isolating piece, because I'm not isolated, but I'm sick of being in this house. So I imagine people that are, you know, because yeah. we can't we can't really go anywhere. You don't have an escape. You don't have anywhere to go. Where are you going? Where are you going? Yeah. You, you can't yeah. travel. You know, it, and now you can get on a plane, but you're so afraid to, to do that. So it is a very difficult place. And isolation is is really, really hard. So um, let's get to these last two. So I'm going to ask you, um, almost Dr. Natalie. 
What advice would you share with someone who is currently experiencing, we started with intimate terrorism? Mm -hmm. Someone that's currently experiencing that. What would you, yeah, what advice would you give them? I would um, suggest to them that they be mindful because something about violence is that a pattern always sets up at some point because that's what, um, if you hear my dog bark, there she goes. <laughs> I heard a growl and I thought, here she comes. <laughs> um, there's a pattern that sets up over time. Um, and not necessarily to play into the pattern, but being aware of it. So that when you know that this is typically when they might become abusive, try to change the dynamic if at all possible. And I say that because if outside sources are not readily available as they used to, because my initial response at any time typically is get your stuff and run. Right. I don't care if you're married. I don't care. I don't care. Get your stuff and run. Grab your babies and go. If that was, if that were really an option. But with the pandemic, there's not a lot of places to go. Right. You know. And so then, if you are there and you have to stay there, if you will, try to figure out what the pattern is. Um, and again, once you figure out when they typically might become more abusive, then try to change the dynamic as best as you can. Um, because there is something that you are able to say to them or do or whatnot that kind of lessens their, um, their anger for them. Because a, a, an abuser is somebody that is clearly they're missing something within their life and they're taking it out on somebody else because they are angry that that person is not fulfilling what is missing in them. So in trying to figure out, and it, it is a lot of work and no, it's not fair that you should. However, in the situation that we're in right now, this may be, this may save a life. You know, um, so trying to figure out those things and implementing those things as best as you can. And honestly, if all else fails in running, grabbing your babies, if you have children and running and going, if that's all you can do, then do go to the fire station. Um, hopefully you could go to the police station, depending on where you live, unfortunately, um, but trying to get the help that you can and go and try to call somebody that you might know that might be willing to come and get you and allow you into their home. Um, but again, we're dealing with this pandemic, um, but there has to be some change. There has to be some, um, there has to be some stick in the wheel basically to make it stop at least for that moment to, um, to save you in that moment. Save you. Oh, yeah, I, li I like that. Uh, you're going to survival mode. You have to survive. You have to. And whatever you have to do to survive. Mm -hmm. and, and there is no one fit answer. Yeah. Every situation has to be evaluated. You have to, you know your situation yeah. and you have to evaluate your situation in the most realistic manner. So um, I wish nobody had to deal with it, but that wouldn't be reality. Right. That so we wouldn't be having this conversation if that was true. Right. So we have another question that came in and I think that's going to be um, it for us tonight. And I think this is a really good question. I love the vulnerability for the person whoever sent this said, how do you not become the abuser after being abused? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought it was really good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that question, um, whoever sent that in. And I too appreciate the vulnerability. Um, you don't become the you don't become the abuser after you've been abused because you know what it's like to feel like nothing. Because abuse, the intent of abuse is to make you feel like you are nothing and for the other to feel as if they have power over you. And if that is not the nature of your heart, then think about that in every situation. A lot of times we don't give ourselves credit for the uh, time it takes for us to make a decision. We make decisions in split seconds, you know? Yeah. Uh, when we're driving and someone comes over in our lane, 
we immediately make adjustments because we've been taught how to do that. You learn, uh, you just learn how to make the adjustment. We do that in our, it's a, it's a thought that we have to have. So we are able to make adjustments in split seconds. So if, um, when, if you have been abused before, remember what you felt like as the victim and remember that you wanted the person that loved you or said that they did or cared about you or whatnot. You don't want anybody else to look at you in that light. That's the first thing. The second thing is if you abuse them, then what? What's the next step? What, it, what happens now? You've abused them and then you tell them that you love them and then they're supposed to believe it and then you have started a cycle. And so now that you started the cycle, then that means that that's gonna be the life that you live for however long you choose to be the, be an abuser. So again, the first step is to remember that you don't want anybody, you don't want to be like the person. You don't want anyone to feel like you did when you were being abused. And you don't wanna start a cycle because that continues, that perpetuates. And then your life changes forever because now you are the person that harmed you. Wow. That's good. <laughs> that's that's why you're the professional girl. Twenty years. <laughs> wow, I, I I love that because I hear people say a lot that they are the way they are because it was done to them. Mm -hmm. But I like the way you said. No, when you really look at your heart and you remember where you came from, mm -hmm. then the choices you have to make. Mm -hmm. that I didn't like the way that felt. So mm -hmm. I won't do that to somebody else. Um, that that's a lot of accountability. It is. And it's accountability that you give to yourself. Yeah. A lot of times we rely on somebody else to hold us accountable. Yeah. But we have to, as they say, you got to check yourself, boo. You have to make sure that you're in the place that you're supposed to be in thinking like you're supposed to think. Um, and just because you've been around something and something has been done to you does not mean that you have to become that thing, have control enough, show that person enough that you have control over your life and they did not change you because of what it is that they did to you. And if you're strong enough, like Joyce Meyer, you can build a whole ministry on <laughs> your ability to overcome yes. because that is her platform. It Everybody is. knows what happened to her, but she did not let it destroy her. And I'm sure quite a few people have probably come to the point of deliverance because of her story. So I definitely, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to just people coming out. So that brings us to our end. It's 1035, guys. We are over our time. Hopefully you were blessed immensely, got some great information from this awesome woman. I wish she could do counseling outside of Texas because I was like, oh, but she said she can do coaching. So I'm going to let her, um, what we'll do, uh, team, if you can put her information in the comments, you guys should have some of her contact information already. If you will put that in the contact information and pin it so that people can find it so they can, con they can contact her. She's an awesome woman. I've known her for um, probably about what? Like, how old is your baby? The oldest? The baby. Oh, she's 14. So like, uh, she was an uh, arm baby. So like 14 years, 13 years <laughs> I've known her. So um, she's an awesome woman of integrity. And so I, I, I stand by her behind her. So I want you guys to really reach out, share the information, share this live with some of your friends, some of your family, people that need to just hear this information. We wanted to just have a good conversation. Y'all, we weren't trying to preach on here today. Now we, we, we love Jesus, yes, but we, we weren't do. trying to preach on here today. We wanted to get to the real. So mm -hmm. we have two more sessions uh, next. Uh, we have Thursday, sorry, this Thursday. And then next Monday, we're going to be talking about the individual, uh, some of the things you're dealing with individually. You can ask us your questions, talk to us about your personal anxiety. And then we're going to talk about the kids because people overlook the children as if they don't have any anxiety. They do. So they have anxiety as well. So those are the other two components we're going to deal with. I had a ball tonight. I absolutely love Dr. Look, 
Dr. Natalie. I'm just gonna call her Dr. Natalie. She looks like a doctor, doesn't she? She looks like Dr. Thank Natalie. Thank you, thank you. So um, I, I'm so excited. Everybody's, they're giving you hearts, hearts and, and uh, love on here. So they are really enjoying you as well. So you got, they're gonna get that information. So you guys know where you can find her. So that brings us to an end. Tell your daughters, thank you for letting me borrow you for a little while tonight. I know the people are gonna be blessed. We're gonna share this all over so you'll see it on Facebook and probably floating around everywhere. Yeah. So we appreciate you. I appreciate you awesome woman. So thank, thank you for joining, pouring into the people. I believe that somebody got the lift they needed today. I pray so. I pray so too. So yeah. that being the end, we appreciate you. Have an awesome, awesome day. Love, hugs and kisses. And um, good night, y'all. We love y'all too. And we talk to you soon. They, they got your information in. All right. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.